Okay, then we are ready to start. So welcome to all of you to this uh, Nora startup webinar about women in AI. Uh, my name is Heidi Dahl. I'm a senior data scientist at Posten, so the Norwegian Postal Service, uh, where I started this autumn after 15 years as a research scientist at Synthos. Um, I'm also a WIDS ambassador, so ambassador for women in data science. So this is a global initiative with 200 yearly events, uh, hundreds of thousands of participants, uh, and being visible as, as an ambassador for a program like this. I often get questions like, where can I find, find good women to hire? And why aren't there more of them? And well, I want to do something, but I don't know what. So my hope for this webinar is that we will have some good discussions, uh, talk through some of these issues, reflect a little bit, and hopefully it will be interesting to, to all of us. So to get started, uh, I'd suggest we do a round table around the, among the participants to learn a little bit more about them. Uh, so uh, I would like, like to ask uh, the rest of you to introduce yourself, tell us who you are, what you're doing and where you want to go, what, what your ambitions are. So uh, let's start with Inga Strunke, who's a postdoc at NTNU, so representing academia today. Yeah, yeah, hi. Um, as you said, my name is Inga. I've been in and out of academia a lot, but I guess I figured out that academia is where my heart uh, belongs. So we'll see how much I'll go in and out. Um, my master's is in theoretical physics, which is pretty male dominated. And since then I've kind of stayed in male dominated businesses. So I've been in the oil industry, I've been in consultancy and accounting, uh, and now I'm working in machine learning and AI. Um, and um, I've, um, I've, I've been asked frequently in my career, why are there not more women in academia and in STEM? Um, and I've always kind of thought that, but I'm one of those who are in, you know, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, um, uh, maybe we should ask women outside, but then for instance, I have a sister who is outside uh, academia and outside STEM. Uh, and when I ask her, why aren't you in academia or STEM? She's like, why should I be? Uh, so maybe uh, the solution isn't asking those who are outside afterwards. So, so we who are inside will just have to wreck our brains. Uh, and I really look forward to doing that with you. Thank you. Then we go on to, uh, to Marit Revan, Revan, who's co-founder and CEO, CEO of Strisa. Welcome. It's, imp it's important to say Strais because Strisa in Norwegian does not sound cool at all. So, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, my name is Marit. I am a co founder and CEO of uh, Strais. We are a yeah, 22 people AI startup based. Uh, it was originally based on research from NCNU, actually, but now uh, we're an also based uh, company. And uh, what we do is basically analyze and connect large amounts of online data about businesses and people involved in businesses to create a, a customer platform that helps automate a lot of manual work related to um, for the financial industry, particularly related to empty money laundering, know your customers, um, having a, uh, yeah, a risk based overview of uh, large customer portfolios and so forth. So, um, yeah, and um, uh, yeah, that's what we do. And uh, I'm excited to be here to talk more about, you know, women in AI, because that is a super important topic and something that is high on the agenda at Strice as well, because we really want to get more women involved uh, in every part of the business. And it's hard. So uh, excited for the discussion. Thank you. And the last panelist is also with ambassador. Uh, <laughs> Mia Ryan is a manager of analytics and data platform at Red Pill in Pro Analytics. And she'll also represent as one of the people who hire data scientists and AI experts today. So can you say a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah, you kind of, uh, as I said, my name is Mia Ryan, and uh, I think you said a bit about that. But uh, I uh, work in a subsidiary of a company called the Red Pill in Pro. So we started an uh, own subsidiary called uh, Red Pill in Pro Analytics. And what we do is basically we work with data platforms uh, and uh, the architecture and infrastructure around to get the uh, sort of AI modeling functioning and, and enabling uh, data scientists and AI practitioners uh, 
Uh, and uh, yeah, in, in my focus, as you said, is probably hiring. And I get that question, or we actually get a question a lot because we're hiring a lot of people. And uh, it's like, why are you not hiring more women? And there's a very interesting question because in my eyes, there are none, but <laughs> there are several reasons to that. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to discussing that today. Well, thank you. So I hope we can have a, an engaged discussion here, here. So there's no raising of hands or everybody just chip in when you want to. Uh, so I guess the, a question to start with is why? So why is it important to have diversity? Why is it important to have a bal gender balance um, in AI, whether it's in the workplace or in, in, in education? Yeah, well, I can just uh, start off with some thoughts. And, you know, the product that we develop, it's an end user product. It's a, you log in into the browser, people who work in banks and financial institutions go in there to make important business decisions. And our users are both, are all genders. So it's really important that people who design and make this tool, you know, have uh, all kinds of different perspectives. So we're sure to really make a good experience for all of our users and not just being biased towards one uh, particular group. And uh, I can really see that, you know, um, some of our designers are, you know, our lead designer is a woman and she has different thoughts than someone else and might be more concerned with different topics than someone else. So it's, yeah, it's just to make inclusive products. I think uh, another thing is that what we kind of see when we're hiring is that a lot of women are very into are there a lot of other women in your company in your team in is there something that if, will I be alone <laughs> and I see that if you have more women in the, in the, your team or on your workspace then kind of it it gets more women in as well uh, you can use that as sort of a recruiting uh, thing to do so I, I, I would suppose that if you get more women in then I think it will get just substantially more women in after that as well just so reaching a critical mass of yeah, and it's women in the workforce. Like a hockey stick. So, yeah. yeah. And then also, you can't really make the opposite case. You can't really make the case for excluding half the world's population uh, from, from uh, a field. Then, if, if um, I mean, the, Grace Hopper invented the compiler, that was a woman. Uh, a woman founded the world's first university. Uh, one of the most important conservation law theorems in physics uh, was. Um, was um, brought about by a woman. So it's difficult to make the case for not having women. So there's obviously something strange and wrong with the system that uh, mm -hmm. somehow doesn't engage women. And um, it's not so strange and, um, and confusing if you look at it historically, because we are very unfortunate now to live in um, um, a society where women have equal opportunities as men, but that th this has been reality for a teeny tiny speck of history. I mean, not too many years ago, uh, women uh, working on problems was considered dangerous for us, you know, so it's, um, there, there are deep, deep historical reasons uh, kind of for that women don't find their way into some of these uh, subjects and sectors. Um, so you can easily make an ethical case for having to turn this around because it's deeply unfair that we ended up like this. And I also wanted to pick up on something you said because yes, we are, we are equal now, but it's the truth with modification, right? So you have systemic issues. So the way society structures and the, both in terms of the bureaucracies and in terms of social structures. So uh, what do you guys think, think about the challenges we face in terms of getting more pe more women into the world or in, into AI but not for this specific discussion. So I, th I think I can just begin. I think there are, of course, um, a myriad of uh, challenges, but what kind of uh, bugs me is that it starts so early and it's so deeply systemic that it can seem a bit overwhelming to try and address it. It's, it's this cliche that when you want to give a compliment to a small boy, you say, also flink to air, oh, you're so uh, good at this and look what you built. And when you want to give a compliment to a small girl, also fin to air, right? Oh, you're so cute and you're so, uh, yeah, what do I know, visually appealing or uh, sedate or whatever. And it's 
just deeply rooted in us and we maybe maybe we don't even do it consciously or on purpose but it kind of starts already there so saying then um at the university level or at a high school level like why don't more women choose technical subjects or whatever if that has kind of been uh, if they've been conditioned that way since childhood it's a very difficult problem to start addressing so late like even high school is a bit late so i'm not saying that we can't it's just that that the problem has so many facets um, that it's difficult to say that here, here, here is this one thing that we need to change. It's actually with you, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, but if you go back about 100 years as well, I mean, women didn't really have a function outside the home. So if you didn't have a husband, if you didn't have children, then you really didn't have a function. Uh, so, I mean, we were coming from that into, uh, and several, basically a thousand years of that. Uh, and suddenly you're coming into a place where everything is going to be, well, upside down, uh, women are going to go out. And I mean, I think it's just uh, a lot of those uh, traditions and, and, and that history is so kind of, it's called the in, end in our society today that it's kind of hard to break out from. So it's happening gradually, but I don't think it's something that would be like a complete landslide of suddenly there's like you know, 100,000 women in tech, but um, it's a slow process, sadly. Yeah, and um, I also think, uh it's important to just highlight all of the exciting opportunities that AI entails. It doesn't have to mean that you're gonna be the backend engineer of a big AI project or in charge of the data pipeline. But for instance, for us, we have a huge, like it's complicated tech and there's so many opportunities, but it all comes down to creating a user interface that's super easy to use and that automates some manual task for a person and just having that like being able to translate complex technology into a product that's easy to use that just has a lot of empathy on behalf of the end user there's so many different uh, roles there so I think just um, not necessarily thinking that women in AI have to all be like back-end engineers but realizing there's so many different roles that people can fill it's just that's a good start as well it could be I see that at least on our side. Uh, one of our product philosophies at Strice is um, it's a tweet that we've had. It's now up on the wall. It's like users flock to simple products. Product adds features and take user for granted. Users flock to simple product. And staying true to that philosophy is actually really hard because you know it's so easy to just add features and make something complex, but it's really hard to make something simple and just being able to execute all the way from like raw data to a functionality in a simple product philosophy requires a lot of different thoughts and women you know are good at certain things that could really help into that so yeah i think yeah, just broadening the scope of what ai actually a job in ai means as well could be an important thing so if i may then just turn that input back on you guys because we, we started fairly dark and this is difficult and it's important but to turn to, to something positive um, I'm guessing since you, you all work in AI in some way or another, maybe you could say a few words about what role you have in AI and what makes you enthusiastic about it, what's fun. And maybe also what, what, what advantages do you see for women in these kinds of roles? So I can start if you want. Um, yeah. So I'm kind of, I know that many people who work in AI uh, are uh, very inspiring and motivating like Marit and say we want to show, solve actual problems and uh, make machines do tasks that people uh, would otherwise have to do. And I'm kind of on the opposite scale of the spectrum. I studied physics because I want to figure out how the universe works. Uh, and that is kind of uh, still my, own motiv my only motivation in life. I want to know how stuff works. And once I figure out how it works, I'm not so interested anymore in implementing it. Uh, and that was also uh and i'm owning this uh, <laughs> and that was also why i went to ai because i was like hey machines can figure out how parts of the universe uh, work how do they do that this is very interesting um and as a researcher in academia i actually get to dig around in this i mean okay okay i have to publish and i have to teach uh, but otherwise i get to just really dig around and be very curious um and i don't think that this experience is different for women and men at all um, I mean, I'm not saying that other learning uh, experiences are different for the two genders, um, but the kind of I'm, I'm not seeing gender differences um, in performing the kind of work that I do. 
uh, whenever I've seen differences uh, in how the genders are treated or perceived, it's, it's more uh, systemic um, or, uh, or related to the social aspects of it or, or whatever. Um, yeah. And I think that, um, <clears throat> can I continue? Uh, just how you're uh, kind of building on that, that you don't really have, there are so many different roles in, in AI. Uh, and uh, I actually studied, uh, studied law and business administration. That's my start. And I kind of wild into this area. Uh, I just uh, started working in a company that dealt with the data in, the, in the real estate, like PropTech and FinTech. Uh, and I just suddenly said, wow, this is really cool. This is so interesting. So I was just trying to dig more and more into it. And that's how I kind of figure out, okay, I really want to work with this, but I don't really have any kind of a data science uh, background. I kind of do it on an amateur basis, but I kind of wanted to understand how does all this actually go through. If you have a model and you have an application, how does this actually, you query this from that, how does this happen? Uh, and uh, that's kind of how I was drawn into it. So I'm kind of just as much as tech interested as I am in, in analytics and how does this actually work together? Uh, and uh, yeah, so, um, I think for my part uh, right now, my ambition is just to kind of, you want to get companies data driven, you want to uh, start small and just figure out little business problems and getting them towards uh, using uh, AI and ML a lot more in, in their everyday business. Uh, and also facilitating for every kind of aspect of the uh, analytics, all the different uh, processors, and also making it um, available for everyone. So that even people without kind of a, a heavy data science background can also actually use analytics for doing their work. So that's kind of how I got into it. <laughs> yeah, well, I got into AI. Well, I studied at NCNU at uh, cybernetics and robotics. I wasn't really that good at it or didn't have that much interest either, to be honest. So I did my master's at the School of Entrepreneurship at NCNU. So you got into the whole like startup thing. And um, I worked as an entrepreneur in residence at NTNU, where my job was like, find a research project you want to start a business off. And that's how I came across what, what came to be Strice, as it was a research project at the time, using how to use graph technology and natural language, language processing and machine learning to analyze large amounts of data. And this was, you know, when the AI hype began. And I thought, that sounds cool. I have no idea what problem it will solve. We'll figure it out. I thought the technology was just fun to work with and you know I met my two co-founders and we got got strides off the ground but um, and my job today well I'm the CEO so it's about leading the team and uh, when we talk about AI as well like all the efforts that goes into making strides a great product it's not like it's only just one person uh, programming like one smart algorithm there's so many parts that goes into it and you know what we achieve as a team that's the output we achieve as a team that's the most important and just you know uh it's good to have all perspectives team members joining that and just makes it more fun to join work go to work as well when the workplace is more diverse so uh my job is just to make sure we have a great team and uh i do try to spend a lot of time getting that message out to uh, women as well we had a company presentation at NTNU for 200 uh, or girls studying at NTNU. And uh, we try to make, well, at least try to inspire them with a tote bag. <laughs> so, like we command a shift, make space for women in tech. I thought that was like clever. It was super popular. And uh, we have like internship programs where we really encourage women, like students to apply so they can, you know, just get a taste of what it's like to work in an AI business, like early on, you know, don't have to, uh, like uh, alongside their studies and that's been um, that's been an important thing as well and uh, in every recruitment process just making sure you at least get 50 50 in terms of genders to like the last candidates so just making that effort so at least like when you choose the best candidate at least you'll know that you've made an effort looking uh, at the entire talent pool but it's really hard to it is really hard to recruit for a tech company uh, to have it 50-50 for women and men. Like we are not there ourselves and I'm a female CEO and I find it extremely hard. So we haven't really cracked the code yet. And I can really second that 
it's super hard. And the thing is that we're doing uh, analytics, which is kind of, there's slightly more women in data science than they're in, is kind of in data engineering that we're, we're also hiring for. Uh, and, but in our company, Red Pill Impro as a whole, I mean, we're going really deep down in the stack. It's uh, a lot of infrastructure, a lot of kind of managed services. And uh, to be honest, it's just, there are no women. I mean, there are a few and we're really struggling to get a hold of them. And uh, we've started to recruit abroad and start to figure out, is there anyone that kind of want to move to Norway maybe? Could we help with that? Uh, just to sort of get the, uh, the uh, female uh, percentage up. But right now, I mean, we are 180 people total in, Nor in Nordics and I think we're under 10% of women. And a lot of us are actually in the, you know, the management. So um, it's very, very hard. Uh, and I really wish that there were uh, more because it's because of the diversity that is because of the, the tasks that you're supposed to solve. And uh, you need you need different uh, sets of eyes on it. And uh, so, yeah, I really wish that uh, in the time to come that this will uh, even out. Yeah, so I just really want to kind of chip in here and compliment uh, Marit on what they're doing. I think it's really important and I can totally empathize, empathize with what both of you are saying, because in um, at the Antenu also, we're really at my faculty, we're trying to hire uh, women to do PhDs, but it's, uh, it's difficult to find many of them. Um, and the reason is, I think that there are just more, um, oh, what's the English word for for the builder? Uh, more role, role models. Thank you. More male role, role models than female ones. And this is kind of a, uh, a, a, a negative spiral then, because if you if you can't recruit, you can't make more uh, role models. And then um, uh, that makes recruitment uh, more difficult. And that this is kind of how the, 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 the bad spiral goes around. And I mean, earlier when Marit said you don't have to be a full stack developer or something, I just automatically pictured a man because most developers I know are men. And I don't know if you say uh, uh, engineer, maybe you still picture a man also. So it's just, um, we're still not used to picturing women, I think, in these roles, unfortunately. So how then will young girls do it? How will young girls be conditioned just to think about that this is uh, um, a, a perfectly natural career for me to choose. Um, but we're in a time now where we have to make really deep historical changes, uh, and that is bound to be difficult. Um, so I don't know if you guys have kind of thought about what we should, um, like what concretely, what we can do um, to, I mean, yeah, Monet already said, kind of try to uh, inspire students uh, to, uh, um, to apply for jobs, but because it, structural changes are really difficult and very often um, structures are abstract. Um, so how, how can we how can we kind of concretize around this problem? Yeah, well, um, well, my answer to that is just like I try I am I'm like super committed that my company and I spend a lot of time with at, at uh, the university, like because uh, that's you know up and coming generation and god I'm just I think we were seven women in my class at cybernetics and robotics and suddenly I was at NTNU holding a presentation for 200 you know girls studying computer science and other technical subjects so you're kind of taken aback on that like I I can were there even 200 when I was at school but uh, so just uh, really being committed to spend that time and uh, as the leader of the company, I think it's uh, really important that I spend that much time doing it as well, because uh, other people can do marketing and uh, do the like design engineering. And my job is just to inspire others to like come into the company and do those roles. So I'm like super committed to spending a lot of time a lot. And as of now, I think, uh, yeah. And then, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, that's very good. Uh, and uh, but I also kind of wonder, is it, do we have to kind of change the narrative of how we communicate what working in tech is? I mean, do we kind of need to uh, pitch some other use cases? I don't know. Uh, but it's just, uh, if you ask, uh, if you maybe go around to 16, 70 year old girls and you ask, what do you see if you, uh, how would you picture yourself in a role in tech and see what they would answer? Would they say, I mean, yeah, I would sit like uh, we pictured the guy developer or would they say something else? I mean, and it kind of connects with the role modeling part that uh, maybe we need some different role models, some different uh, use cases on how, how this actually could be really fun. Yeah, I think so. And just uh, as I said earlier, it requires a team effort. Like 
to actually deploy an AI system into a product in a live environment with users. That's such an endeavor. I mean, it's not just something you do by yourself. It requires just this whole range of roles. Like you need the, you know, you need designers, you need different engineering roles. You need people to think about the product. You need to have like a philosophy on how to manage like data and the roadmap and all these things. And I think in that there's so many roles that women could could do really well and it isn't within ai even though you're not like necessarily down deep in the the coding so in those roles as well we really strive to show that it's you can work with ai and you can have you know even maybe even more impact and influence than if you were the coder yourself but you know uh, there's many ways into ai uh, yeah, and it's it's so much about uh, I mean how we work. I mean we set up data platform for our customers so they can get more data driven. And in that is like one thing is the technical part, but the thing is that it is a cultural change. It's it's learning to think more about data and how you can actually use that data into uh, solving your real business problems, your innovation. Uh, and as you might have said, there's so many different roles in that. I mean you can do anything from that doing that process, just keeping that gatekeeping that uh, uh, data. Mm -hmm process and uh, you don't really have to get deep down and gritty nitty gritty with the technology I mean just look at no. me I came from, I didn't come from a technical background but still I'm kind of working with the data platforms and it's just in a more conceptual way in an architectural way so uh, yeah I think there's a lot of different roles that I mean it would be nice to highlight that you do not if, if you know coding is not really your cup of tea then well there are lots of other things to do Mm. So that's actually reflected reflected in a comment we got in the comment section now, uh, where uh, sorry, th things are moving here. But uh, someone someone mentioned that uh, you can include people with different backgrounds. <coughs> it's not necessarily that uh, we need to get um, get women to be become computer scientists in order to get into AI, as we've talked about. People from lots of different areas come into the into the subject and to be honest for my part working in data science as a sort of framework over AI as a way of using data to solve problems my experience is that it's very or there are people from many backgrounds part participating in solving the problem you need decision makers to make sure you have you're solving an actual problem that is prioritized by the company uh, you need people who can communicate outwards and inwards. You need contact with people working on, for example, if you want to optimize something in a factory, you need to talk to the people working with the machines. Uh, and you also need good facilitators, which may be a more female role. I'm hesitating a bit with the stereotypes here, but uh, a lot of this, uh, well, at least to me, a key success factor is um, getting people to talk together and getting people from different backgrounds to talk together. And yeah, I think that's really, a, I mean, you need people skills, basically. And uh, I mean, a lot of women are very good at that. So uh, it's kind of when you when you come to, you're doing a change in the business. I mean, yeah, so you definitely need people to go talk to each other and you need to be that mediator in between them and speak kind of the different languages for the different uh, areas that you're talking to. So, so yeah. So uh, on, on one side, I kind of agree with you and I and I do like this perspective, but on the other hand, I'm a bit worried that this will just help uh, reinforce the stereotypes that we already have. I mean, if you imagine any robot that is supposed to be friendly or an assistant, then that is a woman. Uh, and Eliza, Tay, Sophia, I mean, even in the, in the movie Her, right? Or, or this Erika, the stupid Japanese robot who's supposed to be a bit like per perfect looking, she's displayed, a, she, she is a woman, right? And, um, and I think that we really need to do away with, with the stereotypes. Uh, maybe this appeals to, I don't know, gender fluidity or whatever. And I agree that not everybody has to be uh, a, a developer or a coder. Um, but it's strange to me that we say this to women, like, like, you can also join, you don't have to be a programmer. We don't say that to men. Uh, or to boys, right? So I'm I'm afraid that we that that we um, are on a bit of a kind of a a, um, a dangerous path here, if if the way of including is um, is by kind of um, uh, reinforcing stereotypes. Yeah, I get to what you're saying. It's definitely it's a point. It's a point there. Yeah. It's also about kind of taking the uh, what's it called taking tabernov or taking that away the kind of dangerous part about a dangerous in a 
uh, part about uh, going into AI, but actually I see your point very much. And it's kind of, uh, yeah, how this uh, is going in the discussion is maybe how it's actually going on the outside as well. So, uh, yeah. I guess it just reinforces that, you know, there's no right answer and a lot of efforts needs to be done in parallel, which is, you know, complicated and hard and not easy at all. But uh, if it was easy, then it would have been 50-50 already, so. Yeah, and no, I'm wondering a bit because we, we, we're a fairly similar group, the people who are here talking today. We are we are all women and uh, we are- We're certain all, age, yeah. Certain age and we have a certain skin, skin color. Um, so as Inga mentioned in the beginning, it's also the issue of, well, people are asking us how to get more women into AI and tech. And uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I have the same issues as Inga there as well. I did it because I loved it. I thought it was really fun. But uh, for most people, motivating them to do mathematics, for example, by telling them it's fun, it's not really effective. Mm. So are there anything we can do with regards to people who, who may find it interesting as a programmer or as some of the other also have talked about? It's a good point that, yeah, we are all in voluntarily and uh, like all in, so uh, may not be the right uh, people. But mm -hmm. just one thing, um, well, it's I see that as an important topic as well, just to make sure that at least the culture in the business is not biased towards, you know, a bro culture or a very like, it needs to be like a neutral, inclusive culture. So at Strize, we have worked a lot with core values. And people think this is, when I say core values, everybody's go, everybody's like, oh, so boring. And I think about this word cloud that's on the wall with innovative and uh, fast and smart and, you know, all these words. But we have done it a little bit differently. And we started with this, like, when we started the business. And we have three core values. And the first one is you are strice, make decisions. Because at the end of the day, when you're a small company, like, you're competitive advantage is your ability to make decisions fast and move fast second one is smart but uncomfortable if something seems smart but uncomfortable you should do it and the third one is like kind of badly translated to english but it is advantage strice unexpected things happen make them our advantage and this is derived from this norwegian ski instructor that you know every time he's interviewed in the sport news is like no today is advantage Norway because you know regardless of the condition it's like advantage Norway that day and what I see in practice and and every Thursday we have an all hands meeting at the end of that meeting it's just half an hour but at the last few minutes we go through these core values and emphasize some examples you know have someone made a good decision have someone done something smart but uncomfortable is there any advantage strikes that we something unexpected that we turn to our advantage. And by going away from core values, that's, you know, innovative, smart, whatever, that is really like a personal eigenskap or like a characteristic by going to something that everybody can do. Like everybody can make a decision. Everybody can try to think positively about something. Everybody can try to be smart and uncomfortable, but not everybody feels innovative. By going away from that type of core value to the one we're now that fosters like more inclusive, like inclusive environment, because it's not linked to something you are. And I'm just thinking that, you know, I feel that there's so many people at Strides that are innovative, but they would never describe themselves as, as that. So then we don't fall into the trap by having some core values that like, yeah, we only look for innovative people that could be like, it's only the people who raise their hand and say they are who, you know, they're not really, but they say they are, and we would just hire the wrong people. Uh, yeah. So just culture as well, making it like nice to show up at work. Yeah, we have got it. Sorry, go ahead, Inga. No, so just Mari said a word that kind of triggered me a bit, which was uncomfortable. Um, and, and the comment here actually that just came in speaks right to that. This, I believe it's important to hire women despite lack of te technical expertise. Um, so this, this whole topic of um, uh, should, you, uh, should you have like a, a female quota and let more uh, women in that you, than you would otherwise do, would you like sacrifice male positions and hire women instead? Um, 
in order to kind of um, enforce a balance uh, that should have been, but isn't. Uh, and, and that is a bit of an uncomfortable discussion, right? Because it will feel unfair to the individuals or to the men that are not hired uh, yeah, in order, so that you can favor the women. Um, and that is, and th that is, I think, a bit of a, a deeper discussion about how we arrange our society or how we organize, because we have a very individualistic society. Uh, and I think that um, creating kind of, kind of um, enforcing uh, these changes are is is easier in uh, societies that are more um, well less individually focused. So in China, it would be a lot easier to just make sure that more women get into uh, tech or STEM or whatever. Uh, if the government decided that that's the way that it should be. But in a society such as Norway, uh, people would probably protest because why should you hire a woman if there is a more qualified man there? Um, and the, uh, the answer would, of course, be that women have uh, historically suffered. So now for a short uh, while, men will have to suffer. Um, but I feel that this part of the discussion is not uh, sufficiently addressed. It's more like an uncomfortable truth under the rug uh, that you don't address and complain about if you're politically correct. Um, but I think the whole process would be easier if we dared to talk about it more. Say that actually no large historical uh, ch changes have been achieved without individuals suffering for it. Uh, and talk about is it worth to actually have some individuals suffer? so that we can bring this about. And I'm sorry, Heidi, for bringing us back to the, the dark <laughs> no, part it, of the discussion. It's a very good point, but I wanted to also to pick up on something you said, that it's unfair to the men who don't get hired. I would argue that it's also deeply unfair to the women who do get hired. Uh, I've had, let's say, so, someone I know in my network who's a male who, who was in a position to hire people, who said in an internal meeting that, um, there are so few women applying, so no matter their qualifications, we hire them. Understood that the women here are crap, the men are great, but we need the women, so we hire them anyway. And you can imagine how, how that makes you feel as one of the few women in a meeting, right? <laughs> yeah. so, so, I mean, can we then maybe then still have this um, optimistic twist on this? Well, if we want to do something like having a quota, which other systems do we need to make it? successful and uh, what what kind of framework do we need to, around this women to make sure that they get to the level they need to be and it's uh, another part about this also is uh i mean one thing is that if you do a lot of tests on you yeah you can figure out that one is better than the other but uh our experience experience as well is that um it's kind of hard to figure out because i mean generally uh i mean this have no empirical values just our uh, view on this but uh, usually men are a lot better at selling themselves uh, and also selling themselves higher. Uh, we've had um, women in, uh, in interviews here that have come in and uh, we've asked, okay, so what is your, uh, what can you do? What is your special uh, areas? What is your competence? What do you feel really good about doing? Uh, and uh, they've started talking about what they can't do and saying that I'm really not very good at this or this and this just to kind of hedge themselves from being hired of doing something that they're not really comfortable in doing. Uh, so I think that also is kind of an interesting discussion on how we actually, uh, how we as recruiters sit there and choose who we kind of want in. I mean, for, I mean, we have to be honest. I mean, I'm uh, hiring in consultants uh, and they have to go out to the customer and actually sell themselves. And I mean, to, to, on our behalf, then uh, you would want someone that you know that is going to get that job that you're actually interviewing for out to the, with the client. Uh, so, um, yeah, I can totally understand that. So, yeah, it would be very uncomfortable for the woman that comes in, but it's also like, do we actually figure out if these women are, maybe they're a lot more competent than we actually try, uh, than we actually get to, or was it called, uh, than we actually figure out in the meeting or in the interview. So if I may, I, I want to bring in uh, a, a second perspective on that. So I, um, I do agree with you 
uh, but I, I um, I heard a comment that really made me think the other day, because um, in I feel often in academia and in mentoring in academia, women are told to be more like men. That's not the the exact sentence, but it's stuff like lower your voice and don't wear pink um, and whatever. And also this, um, just fake it until you make it. Just sell yourself. Just apply for a job even though your qualifications don't totally match, because men do that. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, and and of course that would be kind of a brilliant solution. But also it. it it is kind of tell women to be more like men, even though maybe they don't want to. Um, and just the, the great comment that I heard was from a PhD student who said, how about instead, if this, if this was a less um, paternalistic society, how about we tell men to stop applying for jobs that they're not qualified for so that we don't have to read 50 crappy applications instead of just five, right? So, um, so it's again, this whole thing that maybe we can change the system instead of changing the women. Yeah, and I also think that, because uh, I totally agree with you, because I think it's actually up to us, I think it's actually up to us as recruiters to figure out how can we interview women better in order to actually get out what are your, what you're actually comfortable doing. Is there any kind of a thing that motivates you a lot? Uh, how can you get your competence up? Uh, are you, about, about what area are you on? Uh, and uh, I think that's just kind of changing the, the in, uh, interview techniques as well. Uh, and not to maybe doing the traditional way. So we're, we're kind of thinking about how could we change that in order to make, well, just figure out how to uh, address women in a different way to get this, uh, yeah, to understand this better. I don't really have the answer here, but uh, we're working on it because uh, I, I really want to have an interview that uh, a woman comes in and feels really comfortable and kind of lets me know and in a way that I understand truly what this woman is about. Uh, and uh, that doesn't necessarily come out of doing a use case or doing a test case or uh, getting her to code something. Uh, it might be something different. So um, yeah, they, we're working on that currently. Yeah, that makes me really happy to hear because, well, I mean, women have less testosterone. I mean, that's just a biological fact. We're not uh, physically equivalent to men, right? And me less testosterone means less, less um, impulsive, aggressive, and competitive, right? So then why sh why should uh, impulsive, competitive, and aggressive be like good traits to test in an interview? That's just the it, it's almost like the process was rigged from the beginning. So it makes me really happy to hear what you're saying that you're thinking about it from that perspective also. Because yeah, I heard women that actually say no to interviews just because they know they are going to be tested, and they're no and they have to do a, do a presentation on something that they uh, they are yeah tested on. So um so yeah I think we agree on that. Yeah. Um... We, it was for a uh, job ad. It wasn't for uh, product development. So it wasn't in the product department or in the tech department at Strice. So it was like for marketing. But, you know, it's equally important that, you know, when you're going to market an AI product, you do have some understanding and interest. But uh, for that job ad, we took away all like formal formal uh, krav. So there was no krav to education or work experience, years of work experience, etc. cetera. Uh, we, end up, we did end up hiring a man, but uh, despite that, so, you know, the intention, didn't, was, good. <laughs> uh, uh, intention was good. Um, it was someone without education, like a formal education. So that's good as well, because in society as well, I just, everybody does a master's you know, almost. So like, it's uh, it can be hard for people who doesn't have like a formal degree to get a job. So that's a positive thing, at least. But uh, that's something we've been thinking about. And one thing, just like a general reflection is that I saw some other companies in the startup community went out and had a campaign. And I, f I just it resonated so well because I've been thinking about the same in a lot of job ads. You, you're like, oh, we're looking for a rock star, full stack engineer to our team. And it's just oh, these words, like who feels like a rock star Monday morning at 9 a.m. and you're like, yeah, on the bus, on your way to work and browsing a new job. Like nobody feels like a rock star. So I, I think it's really important to do that. You know, let's take a serious look on how we write job ads. That's a, it's a good place to start. I actually and, have, uh, yeah, continue. Uh, I just really wanted to comment on that because I saw uh, is uh, other kind of a contrary ad that answered one of those said, I am not a rock star. I do not want to work for a super team. And it's all just kind of deflated all that. And they said that what I want is I want to work with people that are reliable, that I can trust. And like, like it just basically, it just, mm. you know, this is this is what I want. I don't want that superstar thing. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of buzzwords and a lot of uh, unnecessary words that you use in Yeah, because the truth is that, it, the truth is, and 
in AI, I said it earlier, it's, it's not like you're one developer developing this one algorithm and that's the entire system. It requires a team effort to put a complex product out into the market or, you know, develop something or, you know, come up with something. So again, you don't necessarily want a single rock star. You want someone who is a team player and can, you know, what we uh, are, what we're able to achieve together as a team, that's what matters. So, um, yeah. I'm not really sure where I was going with this, but uh, yeah, and uh, what we're saying also like at Strize, you don't necessarily need that rock star. You just need someone who is, uh, yeah, a team player and wants to do the job with other people. Yeah, and that brings me back to one of the comments that picked up on this. Uh, what measure do we use to, to evaluate the, the candidates we get in? And it reminded me of what, what is probably too good to be a real story about when they first developed IQ, IQ tests, where they figured the first tests that men didn't perform well enough on, they were beaten by, by women and people of color and stuff like that. So they actually adjusted the tests so that the, the group they favored did better. Uh, I haven't found a good source for this, so it may just be, be a rumor, but it, it makes a point that the scale we use for valuing someone, it, uh, as Mia mentioned earlier, it isn't neutral. We are choosing a measure and we are choosing to evaluate someone on, on certain characteristics. And with, with those, if those characteristics are maleness, then of course we're not going to do as well. Um, uh, and I also wanted to, to go into this um, issue of this kind of to-do list or shopping list of all the brilliant things we want when we hire someone. I wanted to ask you guys also if you think that it has something to do with the maturity of our field as well. Um, I recently moved, moved jobs, so I looked at a lot of ads and for data science AI jobs, they usually want someone who is a data engineer, a data scientist, an analyst, a facilitator, and, uh, and a business developer which is uh, at least five times as much as one person can do. So is this something that's more problematic in our field or is it just a part of a general issue in tech? Well, we, okay, so now I can speak for academia. Academia is uh, competitive and there are very clear power structures. Um, and that, that are characteristics of fields where we see that there is more sexual harassment and that are less welcome to women. And that might be because these uh, properties of the system just appeal more to men and men strive most, most in those, uh, no, thrive more in, in those circumstances. Maybe, I, I, don't, I, I don't know, like, do you, uh, can you blame this on uh, biology or not? But I, I checked some numbers and these numbers are from 2003, but kind of uh, in 2003, where we found most sexual harassment was in the military and second was in academia, right? So it's, it's really the, these, these fields that, uh, that bring about these is kind of bad, uh, bad characteristics in uh, in men which dominate these fields. Um, so I um, I think that the, the properties of the environment uh, are uh, are really the uh, the the prime uh, just cause that we have to to look at um, to to start with. So, so back to not asking women to change, but asking the, the organizations to change instead. Yeah, that's my refrain. I don't have any other ideas, okay? <laughs> that's a, yeah. Yeah. That's a good I one. think so too. It's like, yeah, yeah. why uh, culture and organizations needs to change. And just, I mean, just to keep people working at a place. Like, okay, strice, regardless of like, if it becomes a massive success or if it goes bankrupt, no one, not a single employee will remember that. The only thing that they will remember is how this job made them feel. How, how did they feel when they work here? That's the only thing that people will remember. And it's just so important to remember that like all employers, because that's what everybody will remember. And then it's important to like have a culture that makes everybody feel accepted and fit in and yeah and it just makes it more fun to go to work if it's a diverse workplace it just makes it more fun and then people will show up they will remember it as a good job i mean that's you know easy to say and hard to do and it might sound a bit naive but 
in some ways that's the reality of of, of it and i also think that it, it's uh, a lot of this comes from the top management because if top management allows a certain uh, behavior then that's going to kind of drizzle down to the uh, to the uh, company and it's just looking at the example on if you are uh, at a in English Yulebud <laughs> and uh, you have the uh, CEO or the top management, they are drunk, I mean, even before the dinner starts. What happens then? I mean, most of the other ones actually think, oh, yes, yeah, so this is actually the culture here, so we can just drink and do it. And it's the same thing with, I mean, sexual harassment, it's with the diversity. It has to start top down. I mean, you have to ask a CEO or a manager, it's actually your responsibility to see to it that actually your organization is working in a spe specific way. Uh, because I mean, it, it's mirroring basically, basically what's uh, being said at the top. Uh, and I mean, I, everyone has to work for a good uh, workplace. I mean, it uh, doesn't have to go uh, always from down, uh, top down. But, uh, but I think it's very important that uh, the CEO is very, or the top management is really um, glad of it or uh, their own or responsibility here. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Top management has to be aware of this. And um, okay, so now we're uh, we're all uh, kind of uh, young, and uh, uh, Marit comes from a very kind of young and innovative uh, company. But we have to remember that very many of the of the companies and workplaces that we have have. Uh, antique uh, systems. I've uh, I've experienced my share of uh, sexual harassment and I wanted to do stuff uh, the right way and report it to HR and everything. And that is that must have been like the most uncomfortable processes that I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, and I just would never want anybody else to have to go through that at all. Um, so it's kind of it, it's it's nice to be a woman uh, when it's nice. Uh, but when, when it's not nice, it's it's really, really uncomfortable. And, you know, slut shaming and victim blaming and all that are re like really happening in Norway today at various companies. Um, so to to change these processes, I think, is uh, is really the, the responsibility of everybody involved or not. Um, and um, I think perhaps in particular men who have hold more positions of power than women today uh, should kind of be aware of the problems that go on around them. And, um, and I mean, we should all kind of be aware that probably if we know a woman, she has experienced sexual harassment or worse. Um, and we should kind of try to, to, to become good, I don't know, um, ambassadors or helpers or allies or whatever, and trying to help improve the systems that are in place uh, right now, because we shouldn't fool ourselves and think that we live in a gender blind society and everything is nice. I think you make an excellent point there that this shouldn't be the responsibility of women to fix it. it it's everybody's problem. So, so I see we're approaching the end of the webinar. So I have a couple of questions for you to you guys to round up. And I've noticed them that I'm, I'm calling you guys, even though that's not properly gender neutral. So apologies for that. But uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, sy systemic inequalities and gender inequalities and systemic problems. So you can think about where uh, schooling, even kindergarten, university, work, academia, government initiatives if you would or can you give me some examples of things we should be doing in one of these areas to make to make a change to the systemic problems other things that can be done or do we just need to chip away a little bit at a time and hope we'll get there in 500 years is that a leading question <laughs> <laughs> slightly yeah I mean, you have this uh, drag and drop uh, coding games for kids. I think that kindergartens uh, should uh, install them and then make all the kids, also the girls, uh, design games and uh, build little cars and, uh, and whatever. So I think we have to start really early. And then we have to stop kind of giving boys tools for kids now um, toys for building and uh, girls tools for decorating. Of course, if they, if they want to choose those games, they can do that, but we, sh we should kind of uh, not, uh, not lead them on as much as we're currently doing. And I really agree on that. I have two boys. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to like uh, let them try to use the scratch in those little uh, kind of games to learn how to code. But um, I also have a little uh, what's it called niece. Uh, she's a little too young yet, but I'm so definitely going to give her the exact same tools <laughs> as you are going to learn this. And her dad is really into that. So I think we just all have a little responsibility here to just try to kind of yeah 
encourage that uh you know even video games and just do the typical uh boy things i do actually i understand that if a girl really wants to play with a doll instead yeah fine but i mean maybe just one or two figure out that oh you know gaming was really fun or coding was really fun it just takes a little uh part of it and then uh yeah then you go yeah same um uh, i'm not sure if i had them have that much to add uh yeah just uh well, for me, as I said, well, maybe hard for tries to be like, yeah, <laughs> you know, doing recruiting efforts in kindergartens and primary schools, but <laughs> at least as early as possible at the university, even like um, posting um, strikes and that AI is a cool opportunity to just starting out as well. That's uh, well, at least one of the very specific contributions that we and I can do. Yes, and it kind of like it's a it goes with aim for us as well because you know in order to develop a competitive product like that is used by all kinds of people you just need all kinds of people making it as well it's just it it's just yeah goes without saying yeah and i noticed as part of this discussion we've talked a little bit as of as if young women are without agency so the thing you can do as as a young person in general to uh, to make your way into an interesting position. So a final question, uh, what advice would you give to a young person who may be interested in working in AI, but is not sure how and in what and why they should choose that before anything else? Well, so what I always say to students is don't do what you think that you should do. So don't choose topics because you think that uh, they're going to do good on your resume or whatever. Just like really follow your nose and your curiosity because you can't plan your career. So if somebody's thinking, hmm, I would like to work in AI, to just kind of find out what part of it appeals to you and then just really go for uh, go for that. And uh, like, don't be scared. None of us know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, I would second that. I don't really have any. <laughs> Very intelligent, those listening there. So. Yeah, no advice I, uh... for your needs. Sorry. No, I was just, uh, yeah, if any yeah, students uh, are interested, do what, like Inga said, don't do what you think you should, but do what you think is could be fun. And uh, just like uh, it was, um, uh, was it two summers ago? Uh, we had an internship program for um, like on product development, tech and product development. And we didn't have any like on the business side because we were just starting out. We were more on a research project still and so forth. But, you know, there was a student, he was a, a guy and reached out and was like, hey, I'm super interested in AI. Um, I'll come and work for you for free this summer. And I was like, oh, but, you know, the problem isn't really, you know, a summer student is not that big of an expense. I was like, no, the problem is more that, you know, with any one to really follow you up over those weeks. So I don't think it would be a very good experience for you because I don't we don't really have any time. And he was like, no, you know what? I, don't don't worry. Like, we set up something. We'll figure it out. I just really want to work. You don't have to pay me. I just want to come in and like do something for four weeks. And he was so persistent, like, and then I was like, oh, I can't say no to this, like, young and really energetic person. So it, of course, ended up with him being, like, higher paid because I felt like, oh, I can't have him work here for free. Uh, and, of course, we set aside some time to figure out a project that he could work on. So also, if anyone are interested, I mean, it works to just reach out to people and be persistent or just be like, yeah, I, I want to. Uh, and that experience also left me because he did it like he was really, you know, a go getter. And that experience was also like, oh, okay, I can't just if I if we don't have any opportunities, it's only the go getters that will call us like we need to be very systematic in our student building, which has led us to all do these internships programs and removing these uh, formal requirements from job ads and so forth. So, yeah. That was not very specifically formulated, but uh, yeah. <laughs> no, but if you want something, go for it. Basically. Yeah, reach out. At least uh, yeah. doubts. And uh, well, I think a lot of, 
as Inga said, of course, there's a lot of antique uh, workplaces, but, you know, try to reach out to the ones that seem more inclusive. Um, maybe there are some better opportunities there. And just know that like a lot of people, my, myself included, have this topic like diversity on their agenda and think about it and like ask your peers, like, do you have you any experience with an inclusive workplace or have you heard about anywhere, you know, where there's equal opportunity and so forth? Yeah. So then I think it's time to wrap up. We've reached our hour of discussion and I've enjoyed it very much. So thank you so very much for your insights. Uh, and thank you in the audience for the questions and for following us for this hour. And then hope to see you at the later Nora start a webinar. So thank you and goodbye. Bye.